Hi everyone. In the previous videos, we've used Terrigen's powerful features like atmosphere, population, and shaders to complete a CGI environment for our shot. We've created dynamic cloud formations, forest populations, and snow-capped mountains reminiscent of a Pacific Northwest habitat. Our Terrigen project file has been sent to a render farm in order to create a sequence of frames which will be used for the background environment as the final shot is composited together. In this video, we're going to render an additional image sequence, not from our shot's main camera point of view, but rather a 360-degree render of the environment from the position and altitude of the three aircraft as they travel through it. The reason for this is that often in a visual effects pipeline, many different 3D software packages may be used to create the visual elements needed for a final shot. In our case, we want to be able to light and render the three aircraft in another 3D software package as well. The lighting on the three aircraft needs to be dynamic as a result of their speed, distance traveled, and the fact that they fly through various cloud formations. In some shots, you might be able to get away with a single image of the environment. But for our shot, that solution would not provide the interactive lighting or moving reflections from the environment onto the three aircraft. Let's begin by adding a new camera to our project. Click on the Cameras button on the top toolbar. Then, click on the Add Camera button above the Camera node list. Give the camera a descriptive name like Spherical Camera. And change the Radio button for the type of camera to Spherical. The Spherical settings will allow the camera to emit rays in all directions when it comes time to render the sequence and thereby render what is behind, above, below, and to the sides of the camera position, as well as what is directly in front of it. In part three of this video tutorial series, we demonstrated how to import camera motion from an FBX file. And if you have this data available for the spherical camera, you can follow the techniques described in that video. For this video, we'll create two keyframes for the spherical camera, one at the first frame of the shot, and the other keyframe on the last frame of the shot. Start by making sure you're on the first frame of the timeline as shown in the Set the Current Frame box at the bottom of the interface. We want to place the spherical camera starting position approximately in the middle of the aircraft formation. A quick way to do this is to go to the Objects node list and select one of the three aircraft objects. Then click on the Copy slash Paste Coordinates button to the right of the Translate values and select Copy Coordinates. Return to the camera node list and select the spherical camera. Then, click on the Copy slash Paste Coordinates button to the right of the position values and select Paste Coordinates. Once the coordinates have been pasted, click on the Set Keyframes button to the immediate right of the position label and select Set Animation Key, then Key All. The position value should turn green to indicate that a keyframe has been recorded. To see where our spherical camera has been placed, Go to a top view for the project in the 3D viewport. Right click and select Center on Object or Shader. Then select the spherical camera and zoom out a bit if needed in order to see the aircraft objects or other camera in the project. If you wish to reposition the spherical camera, simply grab one of its axis handles and move it around a bit. The position values will update to indicate the new coordinates. Be sure to click on the Position Set Keyframe button if you want to save the changes made to the position value. Otherwise, they will revert to their previous values as soon as you advance the timeline. The three aircraft bank away into the distance at the end of our shot, following slightly different paths. Ideally, each aircraft would have its own spherical image sequence. But for practicality and in consideration of the available rendering resources, we decided that the spherical camera would remain traveling at a constant speed and heading for the duration of the shot. While perhaps not technically accurate, it will not matter visually in the shot, and these types of compromises are common in the visual effects workflow. We've established that the aircraft are traveling at a speed of Mach 2, or approximately 680 meters per second. So we can do the math to determine that if the camera continued to travel straight along the direction it is heading for the remainder of the shot, it should be about 21.25 kilometers farther than where it was at the beginning of the shot. Advance to the last frame of the shot by clicking on the Jump to Last Frame button and add this amount to the position Z axis value. Notice that the values are colored blue to indicate that the item has motion applied to it already, but a key frame has not been set yet. 
To set a keyframe on the Z axis channel, click on the Set Key button and choose Set Animation Key and Key Z. Notice that the color of the Z axis value is now green to indicate a keyframe has been set for this channel. Let's look closer at the animation for our spherical camera by bringing up the animation panel. You can press the shortcut keys F7 or F8 to bring up the animation panel, or select one of the options in the View menu at the top of the screen. Expand the spherical camera's animated channels by clicking on the plus button next to its name in the animated items list. Then, select the Z channel to display its motion curve. If the entire curve is not visible, click on the Fit to Curve button at the bottom of the animation panel. The Z axis motion curve is displayed as a blue curve. Notice that it is not a straight line, but rather eases out at the first keyframe and eases in at the last keyframe. This is due to the keyframe's interpolation mode being set to TCB, an acronym which stands for Tension, Continuity, Bias, which are the three factors that shape the curve. To create a straight line or linear curve, we need to change the mode to linear. Now we have a straight curve, which will allow the spherical camera to travel at a constant speed throughout the shot. If we scrub through the timeline while looking through the top viewport, we should see that the spherical camera travels along a straight path until the end of the shot, and the three aircraft eventually bank away to the left. Now that the camera path is set, we need to assign it to a render node. Click on the Renderers button on the top toolbar, and then the Add Renderer button. Rename the new render node something descriptive like Render Spherical Camera. Then, click on the green plus button to the right of the camera label and assign the spherical camera to the renderer. The spherical camera will emit rays in all directions around it. It's common to render spherical images twice as wide as they are high or have a 2 to 1 aspect ratio. Other aspect ratios can be used but we'll use 2 to 1 because it's sometimes expected by other 3D software. Set the aspect ratio value to 2.0, which will automatically adjust the image height in proportion to the image width, and then click on the Lock Aspect Ratio checkbox. Now you can enter any value into the image width or image height fields, and both fields will update and remain in sync at the specified aspect ratio. Return the 3D preview to the camera view for the spherical camera. The viewport should reflect the 2 to 1 aspect ratio. But if it doesn't update automatically, then drag the resize bar at the bottom just a bit to refresh the view, or click on the Reset button. Let the 3D preview finish refreshing, and then click the Ray Traced Preview or RTP button at the top of the viewport. You'll notice right away that the RTP viewing mode accurately reflects the spherical settings of the camera, because we can see the entire environment all around the camera's position. If you scrub through the timeline, you'll need to disable the RTP button. Let the 3D preview redraw. And then enable the RTP button to see the full effect of the spherical camera. You can render a test frame by pressing F3 on your keyboard to bring up the render window. Then, click on the Render Image button at the top left of the toolbar. You can also use the keyboard shortcuts Ctrl-R on a PC and Command-R on a Mac to render the current frame. Finally, there are a few render setting considerations for this image sequence because of the spherical camera and 360-degree view of the scene. On the Quality tab, click on the Motion Blur checkbox and set the Motion Blur type to 3D Motion Blur. Enable the Defer Atmos slash Cloud and Defer All Shading which will cause the atmosphere and terrain to render in the same pass. Note that the anti-aliasing values will greatly influence the render quality when using the defer passes. When rendering a spherical image sequence, or even a still image from Terrigen that could be used as a light source in another 3D software package, we recommend setting the pixel reconstruction filter type to Cubic B Spline Soft, which can be found under the Filter tab, as some of the other filters may be too sharp or produce some pixels with negative values. Now, it's just a matter of setting the image size and format for final render. You'll want to save the image in the EXR file format in order to preserve the HDRI or floating point data each pixel contains. The rendered images can then be used to light other 3D scenes in third-party software packages. Once your render settings are complete, 
submit the project to the render farm. As you can see from the rendered 3D aircraft element, they are being illuminated by the image sequence and reflecting the environment they're flying through. Here is the rendered sequence from the spherical camera's point of view. In our next video, we'll explore one final render consideration necessary for integrating the aircraft into the cloud layers at the beginning of the shot. We hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and learned something new. Thanks for watching.